Hey, good morning. It is episode number 24, Hospitality Live with me, Rupesh. Thank you so much for joining us. Look, I got a new mic today. I'm super excited about that. Hopefully it sounds better. Um, and I am bringing on some really cool people here in the next month or so. So I want to make sure I sound good. So I had to buy a better mic. People are like, you sound, uh, you, you don't sound that great. So I had to buy a mic. I got some extra toys. I'm going to make sure this sounds good. Guys, if you can hear me and it sounds good, hit the uh, comments and let me know because I don't know and I'm not watching live here. I am streaming here on LinkedIn Live. Guys, thank you so much. Welcome to episode number 24. And it's, um, we're already here, 24. Uh, hang on, let me just make sure we're live. And guys, comment because we are, I got a contest going today like we do every week. And this week, we're giving away $50 Amazon gift card. And congratulations to Fran last week. We sent her one the same, like within an hour, she got fifty dollars. So let us know. Uh, we have some, we have some people on. So thank you so much. And comment where. All right. So here's how to enter the contest. Comment, hit the like button right now, right? And then comment where you're listening from, and what your title is at your hotel or wherever, you, whatever your business is, right? I'm gonna go ahead and bring on the uh, special guest we have today right now because I want to get to know him, and I, I 100% sure that you guys want to get to know him. So let's bring him on right now. But before that, hang on a second. Uh, before that, I actually posted something yesterday and it's a mindset that I love talking about. And I had to learn myself because I was making mistakes on this particular thing. And it's this, it is, uh, it is the power of saying no, right? We often have to, we always say, you know what, we're all going to say yes to everything in our lives, but often we have to say no to things because it uh, is, powerful, right? It's people that might be taking advantage of it that you have to take, say no to. It's also being productive with your time, right? So that was one thing I wanted to share before I, I brought on our, our guest today. It's the power of saying no. If you say yes to everything, guess what? You're taking away something else in your life. You're taking away time from your family, taking away time away from your business, taking away time from your team, right? Your guests. So saying no is powerful in any uh, business personal or at um at work. Do you agree? Hit the like, hit the comments. Let us know if you uh, believe that too. All right, we're going to get back to it now. Our special guest here to our featured guest today is the CEO of Remington Hotels. Let's bring him on. And there he is right there. Welcome Sloan. Hey, thank you. Good morning. How's everybody doing out there? Doing great. Um, I'm sure they can hear you. We have a bunch of people on guys. Thank you so much. Ah, man, I, I want to list everybody, Mike, Todd, Patricia, there's so many people on, uh, Sloan, and, and by the way, before the show, I said, Sloan, I, I want to call you Dean, and he's like, you know what, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said that, it would, be, I'd be a rich person. Oh, yeah, move over Bill Gates here. <laughs> so. Why do people want to call you Dean? I, I think it is the fact that there's so many uh, famous people with the last name Sloan, and I think it's just people assume, yeah. you know. Sloan School of Business at MIT, uh, you know, Dr. Sloan on uh, Dr. McSteamy on Grey's Anatomy. Uh, I think it's just, it's more commonly a last name. I think people just refer to, uh, you know, Dean's a natural first name. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sloan, welcome. Welcome to the show. I am excited to talk to you about the 7,000. Mm -mm. Let's see. Rupesh, I think uh, you froze there, pal. It's not necessarily a good start there. I think it's an interview of one here. I guess Rupesh cut out. So we'll see if he gets back on. I would try to entertain folks, but my entertaining skills are a little lacking. So hopefully his uh, connectivity issues are short lived. 
Hey, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, I lost you. I thought you were ghosting me there for a second. Can you hear me? Can you see me now? Yeah. All right. Sorry. I don't know what's going on with my internet. I am plugged in with a Cat 5, Cat 6 cable directly into my router. So I'm not sure what's going on. Um, Somebody hey, thanks to haze us. You know, I thought I thought I was getting punked. I thought I was <laughs> so punked all the time. No, no, no. All right. We're, so we're back. I hope that the internet stays good. Can you hear? Can you see me? Yeah, I can. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, guys, before we continue, Sloan, this episode, Now, I know you guys use this tool, and uh, I think all your hotels use this tool. Is that correct? Yeah, we do. Uh, we actually signed an agreement with Hotel Effectiveness last year for labor management software. And uh, just been a home run for us. Uh, we yeah. we kind of had some homegrown um, uh, tools that we use, and it made sense given our growth trajectory that we needed a more robust tool for scheduling and managing overtime productivity standards. We've always had a very tight labor standard across departments, but this really allows us to indoctrinate the hotels every single day. It's iterative of, uh, you know, making sure that our standard is adhered to and that the schedule is adhered to uh, within housekeeping, food and beverage, et cetera. So just a good game changer for us. And we expect really over the next uh, 12 months or so to save two to $3 million between overtime savings as well as increased productivity. Rupesh, you there? Bueller? Good little Starbucks ad. Well, hopefully he can get that work. This worked out. It's a little, Rapesh, are you there? And somehow he's not on either. Hold on. Make sure. All right. All right. Are we back on now? I think so. I, I don't know. I don't if I know. Connectivity. So I'm I have no T, idea. I'm on a T1 here at the office. So. Yeah. And I'm on a, I think a 300, which is pretty fast. Right. And never had the problem. Sorry, guys. Apologize for the internet, but let's go back. All right. So the perfect labor uh, management system by hotel effectiveness is the only way to get hundred percent perfect labor costs, which is, which ensures total compliance with your staff guidelines, labor standards, while making every manager, every manager at your hotel, uh, an expert avoiding overtime, right? That's like, when we when we see overtime, we're like, what is going on? Right. Um, Sloan, do you say the same thing? Like, how do we have so much overtime? Uh, you know, everyone in the industry is, has overtime up. It's just a consequence of unemployment being below 4% and occupancy being roughly flat year on year. And we're at watermark highs, most markets for occupancy. So, uh, every operator of any size that I talk to overtime's up. And so getting that down, our goal as a company is to get our overtime mix of hours below 2%. Um, and I'd argue most companies are probably between three and 5% of total mix of hours right now, just because everyone's running lean. Everyone has got departments with open positions. So, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, just the overtime savings alone, uh, kind of supports the, the investment in a labor management software. It's hotel effectiveness. Your setup fees, right? So go to perfect labor or sorry, hotel effectiveness.com forward slash Rupesh and save 30%. I don't know what's going on with, with the internet. Um, and, and I think it, uh, and 
and uh, Sloan, I think it's me. It's not, I definitely think it's not you. I think it's me. And I'm sorry about the, the uh, delay, but let's continue our conversation. It's not going to throw us off. Guys, thank you so much for Perfect Labor by Hotel Effectiveness for being a sponsor of this show. Hit them up on the link right here. And um, and please, uh, you can say 30% right now. So hotelfectiveness.com forward slash Rupesh. On with the show. I hope we don't have any more issues with the internet. It's... Uh, Of technology things. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, fire away. I was like, can you? I don't know what's going on. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Can you I hear can me? hear you barely. Barely. Mm. All right. How, how did you get started in the hotel business? I actually, um, you know, I'm an engineering undergrad and finance a minor. And so I went to Georgia Tech in Atlanta, worked in telecom, worked in manufacturing, and very quickly realized what I didn't want to do with my life. And so I went to work in management consulting. And a lot of the work that we were doing there was revenue management, marketing, related and i uh 15 years ago went to work for the distribution marketing team uh worldwide for intercontinental hotel so i she and then the rest has been history i mean i i remember i went and interviewed and i didn't know what ref bar was so for those that aspire to be ceo one day of a company i think there's all walks in life and you now i'm a living example of someone who you know 20 years ago i never thought i'd be leading one of the largest management platforms in the US and here I am. So, you know, you also have other examples like Chris Nassetta was a dishwasher when he was growing up and he's risen to the level of CEO at Hilton. So I think that's part of what makes this industry so great is that you have a diversity of backgrounds and you really can go from the, uh, you know, hourly associate washing dishes or stripping rooms all the way to the, the chief executive officer. Um, but I actually, uh, my background was very non-traditional and I grew up in revenue management in the industry, working for a, a slew of different companies, uh, sales and marketing, uh, and then I ultimately got into business development, uh, kind of M&A with interstate hotels. And then I joined the firm about seven years ago on the asset management team of the REITs. And then um, I've been running the management platform here for the last two years. And it's been a fun ride. I mean, it's uh, like I said, it's, it's an industry that gets in your blood and you just fall in love with it. And at the end of the day, it's a people business. And, um, you know, I'm kind of a double extrovert. So it, it allows me to do what I enjoy every day, just which is interact with people. Yeah, absolutely. And you're from Georgia. And I'm, I went to high school in Georgia. Uh, were you always in Georgia? I was. Yeah, the accent, people hear me talk and they're like, oh, this guy's from Texas because we're a Dallas based company, but I actually grew up in uh, rural Georgia and Northeast Georgia. So I grew up in the poultry capital of the US. So I, I think every uh, chicken farm north of Atlanta, my dad somehow helped, had a hand in financing, uh, but somehow a Georgia boy from a uh, chicken farm land ended up running a hotel company. But yeah, I spent, um, you know, my first 23 years of life were all in Georgia. Right, guys. And guys, can you, if you can hear me, I'm sorry we're having technical difficulties with our Wi-Fi. Um, it's not Wi-Fi. It's actually a hardwired in. It's a hardwired connection. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, but Sloan, I appreciate you uh, kind of just going through this with us. I haven't had this problem in the past, but you know things come up and like just like in the hotel business, right? That's um, things come up every day, and you know you just have to deal with it. And you have to stay positive, right? Um, all right. So you have a team of over seven thousand employees, right? Um, what's the exact number? Uh, I couldn't tell you the exact number right now. It's somewhere between uh, seven thousand and seventy one hundred. So, uh, but I need to keep that stat fresh. It's ever changing because uh, we actually just picked up another hotel the other day. So, 
yeah, yeah, definitely. And 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 so that does that make it eighty eight hotels? It does. Nice. Yeah. So very nice. exciting. Eighty eight on our march to a hundred. So we'll see what twenty twenty brings us. Is that the goal? I'm gonna write that down. Goal. That uh, you know, ten uh, or a hundred hotels in twenty twenty. That sounds pretty good. I think it's you know we have a really good chance of crossing a hundred hotels this year. It's it's not like a stated goal, but it um, it's in the back of my mind. Nice, nice. All right, so you tell us about Remington and what you guys offer. How are you guys special? Uh, well, at the end of the day, uh, we are a third party uh, own or third party hotel operator, and our points of differentiation are ultimately kind of three things. It is one. Uh, we have been around for 52 years and we're an owner operator developer until the ownership of the hotels was IPO'd into affiliate REITs in 2003. And so we have always acted as if we're the owner, uh, which means that we have best in class margins that we operate. So if you take my house profit, my rooms margin, other departmental margins and compare them to like hotels and like markets, competitors of ours, we will always outperform on a margin basis. Or we're very focused on GOP flow throughs. The second is uh, we've grown market share on the same store basis six out of the last seven years. I grew up in revenue management and sales. We have an um, abundance of revenue management, digital marketing, sales and marketing talent through the organization. And actually we have a disproportionate amount of resources in that area relative to the hotels that we so if you go to other third party managers or even the brands that manage hotels, our ratios of above property resource on the commercial side is much higher. And that's very intentional because we want to continue to outperform and you got to have the resources to do that. At the end of the day, that those are, you show those two things to an owner and that's why they hire us. But the third is the fact that I have an affiliation with Astrid Hospitality Trust and Braemar. And you say, why do you call that out? It is because 75 of my 87 hotels, 88 now, um, we don't share. I'm encumbered just like Marriott and Hilton are on big hotels. Mm -hmm. And so it provides a stability within the company that doesn't exist anywhere else. You look at Ambridge, you look at HEI, you look at Davidson. Yes, they've got private equity owners, but they're churning 10, 20, 30% of their portfolio every year and they can't make long term decisions that I can. And that is a key differentiator between us and everyone else in the industry. And so that allows me to hire the very best talent, to hire the best technology partners like hotel effectiveness and look forward for several years. And it's one of the reasons that we can solve the labor problem that we're facing easier than some of our competitors. So it ultimately is better top line, better margin, but it's driven by underneath having better people because um, we're a very stable platform where most of my hotels I've managed for over a decade and will continue to manage for the next decade ahead. Wow, that's great. So they, so pe these owners trust you. Now for the people that are listening, guys, thank you so much. And I'm sorry, I apologize for the internet issues that I've had. I think it's my side slow and it's not you. It's definitely me. I think it's the new equipment that I added on that's uh, that's maybe driving this this thing uh, going down. But um, people are saying it's cleared up now, guys. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you for kind of clearing that up for us. Um, Michael, thanks for joining us, guys. Don't forget, we're giving away a fifty dollar Amazon gift card at by the before. Actually, you know what? Before the end of the show, slow. Is that okay if we just give away a fifty dollar gift card? Hey, it's your show. I'm I'm just here for the ride. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So how do you enter? Hit the like button, comment where you're listening from and what your title is at your hotel or business that you work at. Sloan. All right. So you, you guys have a management company. You do not own any hotels. You just strictly third party management. Now, can you explain that for the people that don't understand? Maybe they're an owner operator, what it means to pull on a third party company to come and manage your property? Yeah. So we, we do have, we will, uh, we have ownership in one hotel and that's growing. So we will be a limited partner, kind of sliver equity. Uh, but currently today, um, we only have ownership in one hotel and that's kind of ever expanding to your second part of the question or, uh, your question in general about what, di what is different versus an owner operator model versus hiring us. Um, you know, one thing is, uh, is economies of scale. Yeah. You know, I have a preferred procurement relationship uh, with Avendra. We buy over $60 million uh, through Avendra. And so you, your net cost will naturally just decline. Um, 
in anything you buy, bacon, eggs, et cetera, yeah. uh, because of our buying power and negotiating power. So that's, that's a uh, item one of differentiation. Also, uh, we manage 12 luxury independents and in those independents, I have onward distribution agreements. So I've got a master service agreement with booking.com. I got one with Expedia. And so my commission rate is actually almost as good as some of the uh, large brands, not Hilton Marriott, but if you compare us to a, a middle sized brand, my commission rate is pretty equivalent. So if you're an independent hotel, you hire us to manage almost on day one, I more than cover my, my management fees because it's simply the savings you're getting through the OTAs. Um, and then, you know, anyone uh, that has been in this business, you know, at the end of the day, a hotel success hinges on the people at the local level. Do you have a great GM? Do you have a great director of sales? Do you have some great supervisors? And, you know, we having 88 hotels that don't change, you know, I'm in every major MSA just about in the US, I can provide career paths to people that an owner operator can't. Right, right. So if you're, you know, owning and operating three or four hotels, say in Orlando, where you are, sure, you maybe can offer like a profit share with a GM, um, but you can't do that with all the associates. Right. And so we can kind of provide career pathing and development that, you know, an owner operator just can't. Um, we have actually taken over hotels in a lot of cases from an owner operator. I actually just took over one in New York and um, their net operating income is up more than 20%. So you may say, well, you know, at the end of the day, they're paying us 3%, uh, you know, base management fee. And the fact that we're growing market share, GOP margins are up four or five points. We more than pay for ourselves. So I think there's a strong argument for any owner or operator to, you know, hey, take a look at third party. Um, I think there's some compelling arguments for it, um, starting with some of the ones I mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're talking about the team. We're talking about labor. The title of this is really optimizing your labor and really getting in and, and finding out the successes that you guys have as far as hiring people. Because, you know, right now, everybody, I mean, oh, yeah. no matter who you talk to, any city, any state, everybody has a labor issue. You were saying earlier when we talked, there's 800,000 open jobs right now. That's right. Yep. There's over 800,000 jobs open in the hospitality industry. I see on, sit on AH and LA's uh, advisory uh, on their board of directors and labor is the number one problem in the industry. Overtime is up for everyone. Use of contract labor is up, not by choice because you just don't have an alternative option. Uh, amount of open positions is up for a lot of my competitors. Turnover is up as well. It's not for us, but it is for a lot of folks. And you're not just losing people to other hotels. You're losing people, uh, a housekeeper in the, the Bay Area who can go make five dollars more working in Amazon Fulfillment Center, mm -hmm. you know, uh, packing boxes instead of cleaning rooms. Um, so it's just a very competitive uh, workforce. I think for uh, the hourly associate, it's just a good labor environment for them it's a really tough environment for operators and owners yeah yeah it's um it's every week you, you have this challenge every week where hotels have ads out they have they try social media ads they try the traditional newspaper ads they try indeed um what are some successes that you guys find where do you find your your staff and and how do you reduce your turnover so um uh, first and foremost i think uh to the second question, how do you reduce turnover? It's about, you gotta do hundreds of things to uh, make yourself a best in class employer so people don't wanna leave you in this competitive environment. And I'll come back to that, but in terms of recruitment, there's a lot of different things that we have done and, in, and actually added in the last year. So first and foremost, uh, we formalized an apprenticeship program for our first time managers that we do in partnership with AH and, AH and LA and the uh, uh, Department of Labor federally. And um, it is, you're a housekeeping supervisor, first time manager managing people, and you want to be a general manager. And so we have a formal apprenticeship program that's a year long that you commit to, you have to go through and get certifications. And it creates a bench strength um, of potential GMs and, um, new leaders within the company, but it also helps us recruit to say, hey, if you aspire to do more, we've got this formal program that will help develop you. We then have, um, through Cell Ed, 
which is an app, Celled. Sorry, what, how do you spell that? Uh, C E L L and then E D. Cell okay. Ed. It's a language uh, app, and we actually offer um, uh, English as a second language for free for our associates. Because what we found is for particularly housekeeping, um, one of the big things that hold back our hourly associates uh, to a supervisor or managerial level is language barrier. And so we wanted to break down that barrier, and we offer that for free. Uh, we have um, almost 70 associates going through that now. Our goal is to get that up to 150. And as we were trying to recruit housekeepers or someone, food and beverage, really any discipline, we can sell that to, hey, okay, English may not be your first language. We offer this for free so that you can kind of develop that skill um, and kind of break down some barriers for promotion. We also offer it in reverse that if you're an English uh, and you want to learn Spanish or another language to help you in business, it's it's for free. We then have partnered with uh, six different cities, Dallas being one of them. We I just went to an event with Mayor Rawlings. Where we're partnering with local high schools. Um, it's a youth employment program where they may be graduating from high school in the next 12 to 24 months, and they don't want to go to college. And so the hospitality industry provides a great career path for someone who starts as a dishwasher, becomes CEO. And we are recruiting directly from even uh, local high schools. Orlando is actually one of those markets that uh, in the six. And uh, we also are utilizing J1s more often than we have. So the mostly Europeans over here on a visa, they mm -hmm. just graduated uh, college. They're well-educated, they're multilingual. And so we, we've got a, a slew of J1s that just graduated from our Lakeway Resort down in Austin. Uh, going into summer season, uh, the majority of our front office and food and beverage operation at the Sheridan Anchorage will be J1s. And so what hopefully the pic picture I'm painting here in a long way to fashion is it is not just a one um, you know, s size fits all. You have to have programs that address different areas. You know, we're also uh, trying to recruit military folks more often. We've put a focus on uh, inclusion and women in the workplace. Uh, we're a big supporter of the Forward Conference for Women in Business that AHNLA does. Mm -hmm. And But at the end of the day, you've got to have, um, you know, a multi-layered approach to address different jobs. You know, for example, my recruiting team is going to seven different universities this spring to recruit graduating uh, folks into kind of first time manager position. So it's, it's multi-pronged um, and I don't think you're ever done, um, but you know, we have had our turnover decline from 17 to 18 by double digits from 18 to 19. And we want to keep that trend and our turnover is well under the industry average. And I think it's because we're doing so many things that are pro associate not only recruiting, but retention oriented and development oriented, that it's uh, helping us solve this labor puzzle. But right. I think a pretty long winded uh, response. I could keep going on other things we're doing to recruit. But I think I think if you just shared a list of 10 things that you guys do as far as uh, and had that as a, as a cheat sheet, I think a lot of people understand the power of Remington and what you guys do and how you're different than everybody else. Um, but I love if you can give a tip to people that maybe are running their own hotels. They might have 10 or 15 hotels that might they be running, or they might be running one property. What tips do you have for them, for these guys that are on? Guys, thank you so much. Uh, everybody that's on, there's a lot of people on Sloan. Uh, what can you give them as far as like a couple of things that they can do on their property when they can't afford or they can't bring you on as a management company? Yeah, I think it starts with uh, identity um, and culture. Every single general manager, every single departmental manager can bring that energy of hospitality that every single day matters and that attention to detail that the guest sees that ultimately makes a difference. And having a daily stand up, uh, you should, if you're not doing that, you should be doing that at every single hotel where each department is represented and um, kicking off the day with a lot of good energy and a focus on what needs to be done in the day. You know, I, I'm a young CEO, um, you know, I'm 38 years old and people always say, well, wow, you had a meteoric rise. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've 
try to do is that identify with the role that I'm in. Not that I, oh, I was awarded the CEO. No, I am the CEO. And if you want to be a leader, you have to identify with what is necessary for that role. And yes, you may not have resources or money, but a big part of it is attitude. Uh, and then ultimately the culture that you're creating at the local hotel level um, is something that everybody can do. And I, I think um, I just got done reading Atomic Habits by James Clear. And it talks about, you know, business leaders that are very successful that you identify with that definition of success that you want to uh, be. You know, a good, a good example, he uses this in the book. So if you're trying to quit smoking and someone comes up to you and offers you a cigarette and you say, um, no, I'm trying to quit, you're still identifying as a smoker. But if they come up to you and say, hey, would you like a cigarette? And you say, no, I don't smoke. That's a very powerful difference. I like that. I like that. And I think at a hotel, you know, if you say, hey, we're struggling with guest satisfaction. No, we're here to deliver a great service to our guests. That identification, that's a big, powerful difference. Let me ring the bell. I love that. because that's So you're saying that is mindset. Is that what you're that saying? That is mindset. That doesn't cost anything, man. It's no. all mindset. I love that. You know, there's a lot of GMs I talk to, and you probably, you probably talk to them every week, too. You're like... You just know the difference with a from a passionate GM to one that's just mediocre. They're just there to do their job. They're just there to work till three o'clock or the five o'clock, and and then go home. They're not worried about their team after afterwards, right? They're not worried about the other stuff. They're not even worried about their own job because they might not care. You know some of those people, right? Yeah, I, I mean that's why our slogan at Remington is we are the place where passionate people thrive and passionate is very intentional because we're not for everybody. Uh, we're very accountable. We're very results driven and it is day in day out and thrive means for a long time. Right. And I love that you're saying you're not for everybody, right? Yeah, um, we're not. It, it just like in the labor force, like sometimes we feel like we need to hire just the, a warm breathing person just to get in because we need to get over this week or this month or whatever. But that's something that can really hurt your your the rest of your team, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not, I, I, I hey, when you get as big as seven thousand associates, you do have role players, but that role those role players need to identify with the culture, right. uh, and definitely your leaders have to have that passion and that drive and that will to want to thrive. I, I, I attended a conference about a decade ago and I remember one of the keynotes was Glenn Fogel, uh, who's now CEO of Booking Group. But at the time he was, a, I think, a SVP of M&A for, for Priceline. And I remember he showed, now it was a bit extreme, but he showed a video of a cheetah running down a gazelle and killing it on the plains of Africa. And his comment was, I wake up every single day ready to sprint at 60 miles an hour um, with knowing that, you know, I'll miss the mark a lot of the time. Right. And I remember thinking to myself, man, that just sounds exhausting. You know, I'm like, the, the come with, how do you come with that amount of energy? And what I realized over time, you have to be in a business that you take pleasure in the process. Right. Uh, so if you're an achiever or you're driven by, I want to make more money, I want to make more position, you're not going to get there unless you take joy in the day to day, the day to day interactions with people, the day to day interactions with your staff. And that's how you bring that culture, that thrive, that passion every day is because you just enjoy the process. Right. And yeah. so I would say to somebody, hey, if, if all it is, you're just going to take pride once you reach the mountaintop, you're never going to get to the mountaintop because there's a lot of struggle going up the mountain. Absolutely. Every day is a struggle for most hotel people, right? You're dealing with a lot of different things. You yeah. might, it might be long hours. It might just be. Somebody your didn't show up for work. We have the labor problem we're talking about a guest who's pissed off that their room was. So it's, there's a lot of daily friction. Right. And so your mindset is a huge, huge asset to your your personal self, right? Is that, is that, do you agree with that? I, it's, it's, uh, you know, it what inoculates you, you know, where, uh, you know, where you actually take joy in the fact that you can make a difference when somebody has got a bad situation. It, you know, um, you know, I've had several 
uh, pretty significant HR issues, you know, any large company would, mm -hmm. and versus being frustrated, you move to one of empathy. And um, I think it helps you solve problems better where you don't have a victim mentality. You have, hey, I, I am empowered and in this role that you can make a difference. And I think, again, you got to identify with what you want to be and you got to take joy in the process. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're talking about your, the benefits of working for your company or working for the hotel. But what are some benefits or what's the process when you hire somebody? What is it? Is it a three step process? How are on property managers? Uh, as far as a process or at your company, what's the process that like, you have other people interviewing them as far as associates, like what ha happens after you entice them to come in because you have all these nice benefits, right? What happens next? Well, uh, first it depends on the position of what they ex should expect from a recruiting perspective, uh, for our uh, key executive positions, you know, we have, a, a um, you know, we also do s some testing of folks pending the position. We also do kind of cultural behavioral interviews to make sure they're fit. Um, if it's a key uh, GM or director of sales, well, we fly them to Dallas most of the time. Uh, if it's an hourly associate, um, you know, we've, we've got support and kind of processes out in the field that try to identify like-minded associates. Um, we've also looked at software uh, that we don't currently use, but we might that may help with screening uh, candidates ahead of time. Um, and then to the second part of your question, which I think a lot of employers miss the mark on, but we've tried to materially improve is onboarding. So um, not only are you, you know, you can't just hire someone and then automatically expect them to be doing the job day one at a hundred, hundred percent of your expectation, yeah. you got to set them up for success. And so, um, for our general managers, we have Rennington University that we put them through. There's a full onboarding process that DVP of operations puts them through. Um, there, uh, for all the associates out in the field, we have an onboarding process orientation, you know, taking through them through the Remington handbook. And so um, we can always do better. I think that's something that we we're working towards. We've just moved on to ADP Vantage and have a learning management system that we're building out through that, that will automate a lot of the onboarding. What does that mean? Uh, hold on, hold on. ADP advantage, what does that mean? Uh, so what we've moved on to for our HR and payroll. So uh, Vantage is a platform uh, that ADP sells. And as part of that, you can actually, there's a learning management system software mm -hmm. where uh, say you join as a front office manager with us. On there, we can build out various certifications and timing of training that you have to go through and it's kind of self-paced career development and onboarding and so that's what we're building out so it's more scalable uh, so you're not just reliant on okay my boss is going to take me through all these steps some of it is self-paced um and then you know go ahead is it departmental it is yeah so you know you can have there's housekeeping engineering and we're building a lot of that out now, but some of that is cross-functional. I mean, a good example is we use uh, in that learning management uh, system, you have access to Skillsoft classes. So if you wanna learn how to do pivot tables in Excel, you can go and do that right now for free, regardless of what department you're in. That's cool. Nice, nice. All right, so the trade, so once you have them and they go through a process, you go, they go through all, your onboarding process, right? And how many days or weeks does that take? I think it, it totally varies by position. Uh, right, so let's say I come in, I want to be the front desk supervisor or front desk associate at your one of your hotels. What happens to me? I come in the first day, I get a uniform, maybe a name tag. Um, I get introduced to everybody. I, wa I maybe shadow somebody for one day. What happens? Yeah. So in that situation, we definitely would have, uh, you know, you shadow a few folks also, uh, you know, spending some time with the GM to learn about different the different departments so that how the different functions of the hotel interact. And it's not, um, uh, you know, hey, you start day one and you're just doing the job. There's a series of kind of training scheduled out over a three or four week time frame. Yeah. Um, but it's iterative. I think the key with training, too, is that you don't just onboard somebody for two weeks. OK, now you know your job. Just go away and do it. 
Yeah. You, know, you have to invest in them at different periods in time, hence the learning management system, hence the apprenticeship program that we've launched, that training and career development is iterative. And I think the biggest mistake that a lot of people make is they throw a ton of information at the person, the associate right when they start, and then they kind of throw their hands up and back off. And that was me. That was me. I, I made the mistake of, so back in the day when I was a general manager at one, at one of the properties, at a property, I would go in and say, all right, welcome aboard. Um, you're going to sit at the at the computer workstation for about 30 minutes. You're going to finish these two courses on checking people in and checking people out. And then I'm going to, then, then probably like halfway through the shift, we're going to get you on and you're going to start checking people in. And they would freak out because they've never worked in a hotel. They don't know how to interact. And I've made that mistake before where you're like just throwing them in. And, and people used to say, hey, you know, sometimes it's good for them because they just get thrown into the into the process. But they don't know. Like I, I used to never walk people into the room to show them what they were selling or what they were checking people into. Um, is that kind of the process you guys do as far as your GMs? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We actually um, with our GMs, we assign them a buddy. Um, they then go through a full onboarding process with their DVP of ops. We then wait a period of time and then we bring them into Dallas for a week of uh, Remington University. And then, um, you know, there's a, a series of follow-up training um, uh, there on through their career. And then every year they go through an operational performance review where uh, our SDP of ops who's been with us for a couple of decades comes in and looks at the, spends the week with them, takes them through kind of our best practices, standard operating procedures and make sure uh, that they're fully up to speed and uh, things are operating the way they should. And it's a great learning iterative experience for the general manager. Um, so, uh, and we're always introducing new training or um, new things that we're focusing on just this past month in January. You know, we, um, we partnered with AHNLA and we did uh, human trafficking training for every associate in the the hotel, you know, if you see something, say something mm -hmm. um, and stand up to human trafficking. And so we've really taken a zero tolerance stance across the company. Right. And we uh, did uh, human trafficking training at every single hotel. And so I think you have to continue as the industry evolves to introduce new training and, and keep your people up to speed and relevant. Right. So now once you, once I'm hired on, is there an ongoing training at property level uh, where as far as I get to learn about customer service, how to make myself better, maybe think about uh, becoming a better person if I already care, but I just want to learn some like life lessons. Do those things happen at property or do they happen through your system? Yeah. they. <clears throat> so both corporate driven and also at the property level, we have safety committees where we focus on, um, you know, drawing down workplace accidents, making it a safe place. We have culture committees um, where at the hotel level where there's various trainings that come up and you know, maybe it's uh, housekeeping, learning about what is really important during a site visit for sales. Um, and some of it is formal training that comes from the corporate office that we then uh, share with the field, like the human trafficking training mm -hmm. that was really driven by the corporate office. And then, um, every single hotel um, went through that. Right, right. Now, I, I love that we're talking about payroll. Or we're talking about labor. Um, what else can you share as far as getting a team on board and then keeping them? Because, you know, like you were saying earlier, Amazon can say, hey, I'm going to give you $15 an hour. And they promote it all over the place, especially through their apps and stuff. And then all of a sudden, your GM or your or your associates coming back to saying, hey, I can make $5 more or $3 more, even 50 cents more. I'm going to move. How do you keep them happy uh, and, and staying with you a, a long time, right? Like, how do you keep them just going? Well, there's no one answer. And if, you, if all you think is you're going to pay people more and they're going to stay, that's people don't leave for just wage. And we will always lose that battle as an industry, particularly at the hourly level is if it is, hey, here's my X pay today. I think you have to sell the industry, the culture, the career path. Mm -hmm. And you also have to be a shining example of that. Um, when, what I mean by that, you have to have programs that show the hourly associate, like the English as a second language, like the apprenticeship program, like a formal mentor program that shows them a path forward that, hey, you can work for Amazon. They're going to automate that factory in three years. You're going to be out of a job. 
but you work here, you can move on to housekeeping supervisor, executive housekeeper, general manager, B, VP of operation. And so you had to show them a path to storytelling. Um, and I actually mentor personally four people in our um, company. And um, wow. that actually goes down to a few of those people are actually at property level. And I, I think you have to have a culture that is pay it forward um, and have different programs that speak to different communities right. within the company. And that's where culture is the difference maker because you're never going to win on wage. You've got companies, Uber, Amazon, other industries they can go work in that we just can't keep up with the um, uh, inflation on wage, particularly at the hourly level. So they have to be really be happy where they're working more than just the money because yeah, they can go there for the money, but then all of a sudden they realize, Oh, I'm not having fun. I'm doing more labor, laborious work. I'm doing, I'm not, I don't have a team with me that I loved. Uh, I don't get to connect with people like I used to at the hotel, right? These are all some of the things that we as hoteliers, right? We have that benefit of saying you can do, you can meet so many different people across the world. If you came, if you stayed at our hotel or you worked at our hotel really, right? Oh yeah. Uh, and hey, any leader of a company general, or general manager, whoever is listening on this call, go work in housekeeping for a week. Okay. It's hard work. I did it when I was earlier in my career and it is not an easy day. And I think having that empathy and, you know, having that enjoyment and that culture is a key point of differentiation. If it is just paying more money, you're, you're always going to lose that battle. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I realized, I don't know if you found this out, but back in the day when I, like I said, when I was a general manager, um, it actually even happens now where associates will come or like a leader will come and say, hey, listen, um, this other company or this other hotel is offering me a little bit more money. Um, I'm thinking about going and they're, then they then they leave. Right. Um, I always tell them, like, you know, there, there's so many benefits for staying with you because we'll, we'll treat you fairly. We have flexible hours, all these different things that they don't see, but they just see the dollar amount. So it's really our job as leaders to kind of explain the benefits of why they should stay with you. And you're going to continue growing them if they're a, uh, any, any position, right? At your hotel. Um, how do you, all right. So the next question is how do you actually get a, maybe an assistant GM to become a general manager? Cause there's a lot of assistant GMs that are maybe listening here or watching, uh, but they want to be a general manager one day, right? How do you, what's the process or what's the path for them? To becoming a general manager uh so my advice to them is kind of you know multifold. but i would start with um get a mentor uh, make sure you're working for a gm that is preparing you and giving you not just task but real leadership so you have to develop critical thought um you know what i end up the, the a big gap between agm and gm is that a lot of agms are taskmasters Okay, go do this with front desk. I tell you know, so make sure you're working for someone that says, I need this goal. And then they empower you to go figure that out so that you can really learn how to lead and how to have critical thought. Also, I think um, work for a company that has programs that develop leadership, public speaking, communication. Um, that's what our apprenticeship program here is. I've actually got several kind of AGM front office managers, housekeeping supervisors who aspire to be general managers. And through the American Hotel and Lodging Education Foundation, certifications they get through that, along with supplemental training we provide. We actually just did a case study for our first apprentices where they were given a hotel uh, that has guest satisfaction issues and they had to problem solve in a group and actually present back to the executive committee of the company. And that was a learning experience for them because they had never overseen a full service hotel that was having guest satisfaction issues. And so we gave them a lot of data and they had to come up with a path for success. And I think that's the kind of companies you need to work for. Um, you need to have a mentor that you then also need to be part of a culture where there is grooming career pathing to fill in the gaps. And, um, but you have to also be assertive and seek out opportunities uh, for yourself as well. You can't be passive. You know, my advice to any ambitious person in the business is that look to people that you want to be, look at their experience, their life experiences, and then seek out their counsel. 
Um, you know, I, I talked about identifying with what you want to be. If you want to be the GM, get a few GMs that you respect and aspire to be and seek their advice. You know, ask them to go to lunch and ask them a ton of questions about um, that is how you fill in the gaps. Yeah. Um, and there's not any one size fits all. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I definitely agree with that. Now, you know, a lot of people, and I used to have this problem too in the past, is I would be afraid, like, I would be afraid, Sloan, to ask you, like, hey, would you go out to lunch with me because I want to learn something? Or, hey, can I go, can, can you spend a little bit of time with me? Like, I feel like in our minds, we think these people are bigger than us and that we can't reach them. And they're, or maybe they're better than us, which I don't, I don't like. I actually posted something a couple of weeks, oh, last week. I said, you know what? It's, uh, someone that has more money or a bigger title isn't better than you. We're all the same people. We're all trying to achieve something good, right? Um, and and I feel like if we have that mindset of just going out and reaching out, if you want to be a GM, go reach out to like five or 10 or 20 or 100 GMs, right? Somebody out of those, there'll be a few people out of the 100 that will be there to support you and maybe even help you be accountable for that for that position, right? Uh, and, and I love that, that you, it's not just the five people that said no to you, right? Go out there and go reach more people because that's how you're gonna is that how you kind of like said you know what i'm gonna be the ceo of this company and i don't care what it takes i'm just gonna go and learn all these different things well i want to read to you uh you know this is a famous saying by jack welch that i really 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 subscribe to it is before you are a leader success is all about growing yourself when you become a leader success is all about growing others yeah. jack welch was really famous for saying that and so my advice to folks would be if you're seeking out people to help grow and lead you and they don't have time for you to do that, you're in the wrong organization. Right. Because at the end of the day, when you get to levels like me, um, you know, my, uh, you know, building up your base knowledge when you get to an executive position is table stakes. You know, when you're at my level, everybody knows about um, a PNL, you know, some of the ins and outs everyone understands uh, the basics of revenue management basis of contract negotiation that is table stakes that is knowledge the key difference maker and also for good business reasons because you can scale a business is the ability to lead and develop people and get results through people because it's scalable right so you're saying is uh anybody that wants to be a leader or a general manager or even a ceo of a big company like yours is you don't need to know every single thing. You don't need to know the details of every little thing at the hotel. So like, let's just pick one hotel, for example, in your portfolio. Um, you don't know down to how to make that bed in that one room, but you have someone that is well qualified to make that bed or to run the front office or to run that restaurant. Is that what you're saying? You don't, you need to know like the basics of how to operate a hotel, but not actually run that hotel themselves. Yeah, and I think to be a, a good general manager, you do need to be in the the weeds per se of the day to day operations of the hotel. But the key difference maker um, and your ability to elevate within an organization, it just boils down to leadership and communication. Right. And that's the and I think from a career development, if you're aspiring to be a general manager and you don't feel like you're being supported in that capacity, you need to change your environment, change who you work for. You know, maybe within that company, go work for a different GM who's mentored other folks. Uh, but you have to be working for people that are just as invested as, in your career as you are. Nice. I like this whole circle that we've gone through. So we've talked about what you, what, how to um, draw people in, how to onboard them, how to kind of keep them going and, and, and motivated and inspired, right? The last thing is like, what are the tools your hotels use to kind of optimize and um, one, I'm definitely going to talk about hotel effectiveness because that you, you're saying, and then also Dell's on guys. Thank, thanks so much to Dell and his team for sponsoring this episode um, is what tools are you using to keep everybody going? So do you have like five tools that any hotel could use to kind of optimize their payroll, pay, optimize kind of communications, optimize basically anything. What are five things? And this yeah. is a surprise. We, I didn't, I didn't uh, say slow. And I'm going to ask you this question. This is just like, hey, we're just talking as a conversation, right? No, I, I think technology adoption is is critical, right? So, one that's one of the things I didn't call out of solving the labor puzzle. Some of that you get, can get through through technology. Um, you know, it, it, um, for sure, hotel effectiveness. 
um, or a labor management software that allows you to make sure that your um, schedule and your forecast is accurate, that you're drawing down overtime to as low as uh, possible. You know, our goal is to get overtime as a mix of total hours below 2%. Last year, we were just north of 3%. And so every 1% is over, you know, is a seven figure number for us. Um, also um, helps you manage your productivity standards. Um, you know, how many minutes per occupied room or your housekeepers doing for, you know, stayovers and check-ins, et cetera, and gives visibility to that in a real time fashion. Um, and I think that's that, you know, labor is your number one cost. I mean, we're, we do over a billion dollars in revenue. My labor is, $300 million a year. That's a lot. So if I'm off by 1%, it's 3 million bucks. Yeah. Um, so you start there, particularly in an environment where revenues are flat and expenses are growing. Uh, yeah. Wage inflation is around 4% in the industry right now. That's a federal stat. So it's actually 4.2, I think 4.1, 4.2. The second is um, making sure that you've got good technology around procurement, um, you know, we've got an automated purchase order system and then a, a pretty robust back of house accounting system. And so making sure that you've got, so you can control your, your buying and your checkbook. Um, Do you have a uh, software that you kind of use to kind of make that happen? Yeah, we, yeah a lot of people use Birch Street. We use iBuy Efficient. Um, um, I think pinning your sophistication either is a good solution. Birch Street more, is more expensive and it's what you probably see in full service a lot. Um, so I think that's paramount that, that would call out second. We've already, uh, we've also started to do a mobile check-in at all our hotels. So the brands have a solution. We use open key at our independent hotels. And I actually, um, at a couple of our hotels, we're testing mobile key only. And so it saves the plastic cards. Um, so it's a green initiative. And also we haven't gotten to a point that we are reducing front office staff but it's made our service at front desk better because on a Friday at a resort hotel, you're checking in, you're not you know, waiting in line with six because some of those people are using skip the desk option. Right. So it's made wait times at front office better. So I think that's uh, something else I would call out is, um, you know, using mobile technology, whether a concierge or mobile key, I think can give some efficiency, uh, particularly on property. And then, uh, you know, a fourth item I would call out, um, isn't necessarily technology, but I think it's green and it's the way of the future. We've gone containerless in all bathroom amenities in all our hotels. Okay, so bulk. We, yeah, we've gone to bulk and I think it's an easy thing to do to save money. The guests tend to like it. It's a green initiative and, and so it's green, you save money and it's a, a customer forward facing thing. It's not necessarily tech, but we were, uh, uh, we were out in front of that ahead of even Marriott and Hilton where we were already doing it in our independent hotels. Yeah. So I think that's something I'd throw out there that's uh, an easy to do. And then, you know, a fifth item on the tech side, I think you need to have a very good forecasting revenue management platform um, because mm -hmm. if you're going to grow revenue this year. It's going to be done through market share growth. Right. And so if you're in an independent hotel, making sure you've got good revenue management, PMS, CRS software, or if you're a branded hotel, uh, making sure that you are uh, doing a good job at forecasting. Because at the end of the day, if you forecast off, everything else is going to be off, right? I mean, if your yeah. occupancy is totally misforecasted, having a label, labor management software may not help you that much because you're going to be overstaffed or understaffed anyways. So, Right, right. Awesome. These are five awesome um doesn't have to be tech it's just five tools that you're really using to yeah. really make a difference and and make your hotels profitable because at the end of the day you know things are coming down where it might slow down a little bit but if you're ready with these tools and and the mindset i think you can get ahead especially if your competition when they're not doing this stuff you know in, in a few markets that we know of we know that we're the market leader or a leader because we're doing special or using strategy now kind of going back to bulk um this kind of affects everybody. Uh, are you using it not only in the bathrooms, but at breakfast too? So like getting rid of the PC stuff and kind of going to- We, we haven't, we've talked about it. I think that'll be next. I think, uh, you know, where can you save in your food and beverage and restaurants, et cetera. So uh, we haven't, it's just been the in room uh, guest amenities that we've done. 
we've done a lot of kind of ROI green initiatives that I think you're going to continue to see a lot more of as you go forward. So we've converted the vast majority of our hotels to LEDs. Um, paybacks typically two years for all your public space. So if you're looking at and saying, hey, I, I'm going to be up three or four or five percent in wage this year. I can't do it. I got to be competitive. I can't lose my staff and my revenue is going to be flat. So I got to make up the difference. Um, ROI energy projects is a great place to start. So if you're not LED, the payback's usually two or three years. It's a no brainer. We've put in smart thermostats in hotels um, because uh, energy costs, particularly in California, is just on the rise. We've moved to cold wash in all of our laundry. So we have a chemical relationship where uh, with Procter and Gamble through Hilton Supply Management that uh, we do cold wash and we save a significant amount of, and you have less cycles. So you save water. We also recycle laundry water. Um, you, said, well, you, cold, you said cold wash? Cold wash. Yep. So it's actually your linen lasts longer because you're not using hot water and turning. Um, also the chemical and the, the process, you do less cycles. Um, so you're saving energy on not having to heat the water. You're saving water consumption because you're not running as many cycles and you're saving linen because they're not being torn up as much by hot water. That's great. Uh, and so we actually had almost a seven figure savings last year between energy, linen, et cetera, for moving the cold wash across the company. And we actually are, we're doing a ton of different energy conservation things through the company, starting with LED. We're even installing some technology that, you know, most people in the kitchen, they just leave the hood on all day, just mm -hmm. letting it run. You can actually put technology that turns it on and off when you're not using it. And it's like a one year payback, um, you know, and it's simple things like that, that, you know, frankly, it adds up. Right. So do you have somebody at the corporate office kind of looking at all these different. Yeah, I've got a VP of engineering that mm -hmm. um, they are charged with how do we improve gross operating profit margin through energy conservation? That's awesome. That's really that's that's a smart way of kind of thinking and having somebody kind of look at across the board because your hotels are just what they're not just luxury hotels. They're not just a mid scale or upper mid scale. Uh, do you have any, do you guys have an extended stay? Uh, we do. We've got residence ends and Homewood. So we pretty much play in every asset class from mid scale all the way to luxury. Uh, so I've got every, um, you know, I've got a hotel in Napa whose average ref bar is in the $800 range. Uh, it, yeah, it's average rates over a thousand dollars a night all the way to uh, Hampton Inn. So we, uh, our, our bread and butter is a big full service upper upscale hotels. Right. Um, but, you know, I think that energy conservation plays to most everyone. Um, you know, uh, utilities are going up. I mean, you look at energy and you look at water in almost every municipality, the, the rates are going up pretty significantly. And, so it's, it's kind of a thing you can pay attention to and try and offset some of your labor costs. Right. Now I have a lot of these, um, these energy guys sending me messages on direct messages here on LinkedIn saying, Hey, we can save you a ton of money uh, on, uh, you know, gas or something. Do you believe in that? Or have you used any of these companies that say, Hey, we can save you some money and kind of do a, a little test or send me your bills and I'll kind of look at it and see. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. And no. So we have done, um, you know, led pays back pretty quick um, because of your lights are just on all the time in the public space. We've done a lot of smart controls for HCAC because your biggest energy consumer is your PTAC or, um, you know, just your overall cooling, particularly in warm climates. Uh, we've done simple things like the mini link on the kitchen hoods and the water recycling and laundry. Uh, we also have hired a firm to do some energy audits where they come in and look at surge rates in certain state. You know, California is big for certain periods of time. If you're consuming a lot of energy during certain parts of the day, you get surge pricing. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out how you can prevent that from happening. Uh, so there is some um, to it. Some of them are snake oil salesmen as well. So I think that's where you, you have to have somebody with some technical competency to, to justify the ROI. My advice to anybody on the listening in would be don't sign a four contingency um, contract with an energy auditor without knowing your baseline first, mm -hmm. um, you know, because occupants, we're not, 
know, if your occupancy goes down, your utility consumption typically goes down with it, right? You're consuming less water. So don't sign something that says, hey, my baseline was X. You need to really tie it to an occupied room <laughs> basis um, so that you're protecting yourself, particularly if you're paying somebody on a percentage of savings. Yeah. You may end up paying somebody on something they didn't really do for you just because occupancy is declining. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this has been a great conversation. Guys, if you've enjoyed this conversation, there's over 200 people here on this uh, LinkedIn Live here, uh, which is great. Hit the like button right now because uh, we're going to continue the conversation. And if you and let us know because we're still giving away before this is and this is all we're almost over uh, Sloan. I almost called you Dean. Uh, we're almost over Sloan. Um, let us know. Hit the like button if you want to win fifty dollar gift card, Amazon gift card. Hit the like button. Comment where you're uh, watching from, and then let us know your title at your hotel or your company. Right? We want to get to know you better. And there's so many people on. Um, I wish I could say everybody's name to Sloan. You'd be like, wow, these are these are. And some of these people are are your associates from your hotels, I guess. Right? Uh, hey guys, uh, pound room to room to thrive. So. That those are the, those that work for us know uh, what I'm referring to. So yeah, absolutely, that's your hashtag. That's your company hashtag with over thirteen thousand followers on LinkedIn at your company page. Um, you guys are doing great things. I see all your posts, Sloan. You're traveling all over the place, kind of visiting uh, your properties, right? And you do that often. How often do you travel? Uh, I flew a hundred. Now I'm in Dallas. So I'm not doing coast to coast. I'm in the center of the country. I, I flew one hundred fifteen thousand miles last year. So. It's a, I, it's something I enjoy. I think the biggest challenge is I have three small children. So, you know, kind of balancing. Um, but yeah, so I would say I traveled 35 weeks last year, 35 to 40. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a hustle, right? It's a hotel business is never closed. We're open 365 days yeah. and you, you better be ready to. Kind yeah. Of our staff work a lot of weekends. They work nights. I mean, just because I'm CEO doesn't mean I get weekends off per se. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not the one, uh, you know, making it happen. It's our associates out in the field. So it seems uh, it would seem a little hypocritical if I was kind of just stuck in this office all the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And all right. So you talked about flexibility because you want to spend time with your three kids. Um, and so do other hoteliers, right? People that have and there's so many people are hashtagging room to room to thrive. Right. I love that your 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 entire workforce here is uh it has a hashtag and, and loves the, the the passion that you have and it looks like they have the passion too tracy ellen michael paul paula um jamie there's a bunch of people there's a bunch of your your associates here uh on so guys thank you so much it's been this has been a great conversation last question um how do you have it how do you give flexibility to your staff and to leaders at your company when we're open 365 days a year and we have to get the job done. Like, how do you be, how do you have a flexible schedule and sp still spend time with your family? Where does that balance come from? Oh, it's hard. I mean, in this business, that's, that's, you know, it's one of the number one reasons people leave our business because it never stops and never closes. Um, there's no good one solution. I can tell you what we've done at the corporate office uh, where we try to provide flexibility. We allow folks to work from home one day a week. Uh, we're looking at expanding that. We do summer hours. Um, you know, there are job functions like revenue management where people are home-based. I always get the question, well, are we going to allow jobs in the field to be home-based? Uh, some of our sales folks uh, are, but there's just certain job functions. You know, look at housekeeping. You can't work remote, right? You got to be there. You got to be cleaning the rooms. Um, and so I think we try to be as flexible as we can. Uh, we also are currently benchmarking our, our paid time off and our uh, paternal and maternity lead time versus competitors. So we make sure we're remaining competitive. But for sure, I mean, millennials want flexibility. I'm kind of of that generation. I like to consider myself. I'm right in the middle between baby boomers and millennials, so I can speak to both. Um, but, I, you know, we will, from a corporate office, move more towards uh, allowing people to work from home and flexibility. We moved to flex hours where we only have set office hours nine to four and people can come in at 7 a.m. and leave at four if they want, or they can come in at nine and leave at six. Um, so we've done a lot of things, um, you know, but unfortunately, on, the nature, uh, on property, there's not as much flexibility just because of the nature of the job. 
And mm -hmm. I think that's where um, we want to make sure we're introducing other benefits, uh, you know, to to benefit our associates. We just I'll give you an example. We um, the industry in, it, in itself is kind of a mixed bag of health. You know, it, unfortunately, a lot of uh, smokers, a lot of people do work too much. And so um, as we try to improve the health of our associates, we rolled out called Gym Pass. So we want to provide gym at a discount or for free for all of our associates. And so it's actually an app and we fund that. And if you're a field associate, you can go on Gym Pass and get discounted gym memberships all throughout the U.S. And so that's kind of a nice little add on benefit that we offer to try and help with the stress levels out in the field. Right, right. Now, all right. So we're this is the start of a new month, right? We're in the second month. We're in February, right? Um, and people might have dropped. And, and I'm, I'm big on this. I go to the gym six days a week and I wake up at 4.15 every wow. five days a week. I went this morning, right? And yeah. I actually, I have this uh, private uh, WhatsApp chat group for workout motivation, right? And a lot of a lot of these guys are sending, putting up their, you know, their workouts for the day and kind of keeping everybody motivated and accountable. But one thing that we can't keep each other accountable is on eating, right? And and that's a big problem when you're working like 15 hours a day at a hotel, 12 to 15, or maybe even less or more, it's hard to eat right. What's one tip that you can recommend for GMs, or, you know, anybody that's working in the hotel business, right? And just to, how do you find the right, making of the right choices? Because it's hard. Well, that's something I struggle with too. I, I don't profess to be a nutritionist nor offer people uh, simple eating habits, but I think I'm a big believer in that the habits make you who you are. And so I think, you know, you're a get up at 415 person. I'm a, uh, you know, Peloton um, uh, addict. And so I think you find something that you're passionate about, uh, you know, and you stick with that in terms of eating habits. We've actually looked at maybe should we have like a, a nutritionist type offering uh, mm -hmm. that we don't we don't currently offer that. It's not said we won't. Right. Uh, but my, my advice to folks would be, uh, you know, take time for your family, sleep more uh, when you can, you know, at least at least get seven hours of sleep yeah. and, um, you know, exercise does a lot you know the old saying is a, a body in motion is a healthy body yeah yeah absolutely so that would be my kind of generalist advice short and, and life is short so don't take it for advantage 100 percent. Uh, you know for me it's life is short have a good time because if you're not having a good time right now and you're saving it especially say you're trying to save money for the future or you're trying to save this for the future guess what that future might not happen after today and so if you're not enjoying your life and i think the key word here is passion Mm -hmm. Talked about passion for everything. Like you're passionate about your hotels, passionate about your job, passionate about the people around you. I think that's kind of the takeaway from this conversation, Sloan. Um, I was going to ask you one more question, but maybe we might save it for the next conversation. It was the future of hotels. Where do you think our industry is going with the future? Like, what are some really cool things? Let's, you know what? Let's save it for the next next one. All right, that sounds like a, I, it sounds like a commitment. So I look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you did a great job at the promo. I, I loved what you did up, up there. And I, you got a bunch of, you got over five or 6,000 views on that one little short 30 second view. So uh, thank you so much for joining hey, us. It's been a great conversation. Hey, thank you, everybody. Appreciate the attendance and thank you very much for the invite. Yeah, absolutely. And before we leave, Sloan, we're going to, uh, we're going to pick a, a person right. that's most, most engaging here on uh, this LinkedIn live. Uh, and it is, I'm going to pick right now, it, 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 this person was been, has been um, commenting left and right, and I love it. I think his name, hold on, let me find it real quick. His name is Brian Gatzmeyer. Uh, congratulations, Brian. You just won a $50 Amazon gift card courtesy of us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Sloan, this has been a pleasure. I can't wait to meet you in person. I'm, I'm sure we're going to meet here soon. Are you coming to the Hunter Conference? I might be for a, a day and a night, but if I'm not, I'll definitely be at NYU. Okay, great. Well, I'm definitely I'm, I'm almost certain we're going to see each other this year, um, and we're probably going to see each other a couple times. So, guys, if you guys enjoyed this, hit the like button. Thank you, Sloan, for being here. Thank you, guys. You. Talk to you soon. Thanks. All right, bye. Guys, what did you guys think about this episode? I loved it. He gave so many tips. He gave five 
tools and tips and strategies on just optimizing your hotel. Um, I loved it. Guys, thank you so much to Perfect Labor by Hotel Effectiveness. Hit the um, hit this URL right now. You'll save 30% off your setup fees. And Sloan, uh, he told me earlier that they're estimated this year to save 2 to $3 million on their payroll. If you could think of how much that uh, is as far as the savings for their company, think about how much you guys can save at your hotel with your labor costs, right? Um, they're saying between five and 15% based on your room count, based on how you guys optimize. It's a labor management platform that you enter in your employees and your staff and you kind of keep a, a data, um, a schedule on there. And uh, it's all about you know using your data in a smart way. I love them. We use them at our hotel and we're gonna be saving some money. Hit the, um, click on this link right here and uh, please, uh, Please let us know. Let them know that you that I that you guys saw this here on uh, LinkedIn Live, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Next week we'll have somebody special on. I'm not going to announce it till Friday, uh, but I love this. If you love this conversation that we have every week, um, and by the way, I want to know real quick how long should this conversation actually be? A lot of these have been over an hour. We're going at an hour and 15 minutes here. How long should this LinkedIn Live be? Because uh, I'm doing this for you guys, right? I want to make sure that you guys learn something. I always learn something, but should it be 30 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, or just let it go? Comment and let me know right now. Uh, that way I can kind of go where you, and, and also 9.30, does 9.30 work, right? Does 9.30 work for you guys as a start time? Uh, let me know because I want to know that we're doing the right thing for you guys. And please comment to let me know if this episode and future episodes uh, should be 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. Let me know. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. I will see you guys next week, next Wednesday at 930 right here on LinkedIn Live. Thank you. Bye.